Welcome to note set number 17 where we'll talk about oversampling A to D converters. This is uh, covered in section 6.6 .6 of Proacus Monolacus. And uh, this will conclude our uh, coverage of sampling A to D converters. So, um, unlike in the previous set of notes where we purposely, quote unquote, undersampled, um, so if we th think about it from the point of view of highest frequency um, and the sampling theorem says that to represent that highest frequency exactly you need to sample at twice the highest frequency we sampled at a rate roughly two times the bandwidth um, so um, so the application in, in the previous set of notes, bandpass sampling, is thought of as undersampling. Um, here we're going to look at oversampling, where we sample much, much faster than um, the, the rate that we would be told, uh, than twice the, the, uh, the highest frequency. So um, we're, we're leaving bandpass signals behind and going back to like a low-pass type signal, something that um, pretty much fills the entire range from zero up to some highest frequency B, and therefore has a, a bandwidth of B. So um, let's suppose that we have an A to D converter that, that we can uh, use to sample at some rate of Fs, but that rate Fs is um, much faster than is necessary. Uh, to sample our um, signal of bandwidth B. So if we look down here, we've got some signal X of T with a bandwidth of B. Uh, we put it through an anti-aliasing filter just to, you know, that's common practice and generally a good thing to do. And then uh, we run our A to D converter not at 2B, but at D times 2B. And so by doing so, um, we, uh, where D is, is an integer that's much, uh, much greater than 1, we are sampling much faster than what we um, would ordinarily need to sample. And uh, this A to D converter has B physical bits, but we could just as easily say that that is B effective number of bits. And... Uh, so that creates a, uh, a quantization noise that we saw before. Um, we said that the probability density function of quantization noise is, is uniform. So that's the PDF. But we also said that the noise was uncorrelated from sample to sample or is white noise. So the, the noise power spectral density, PSD, uh, is also uniform. Uh, but now, uh, where the PDF is uniform over um, the range of values that can occur, uh, the power spectral density is uniform over minus Fs over 2 to Fs over 2. So it gives a, uh, a characterization of where the uh, noise power is concentrated over the band of uh, frequencies of interest. And since we're sampling at a rate of Fs, uh, our our rate of interest is minus, or our range of interest is minus Fs over 2 to Fs over 2. Now, what we're going to do, since um, we're, uh, our Fs is really uh, many multiples uh, larger than just 2b, uh, therefore we can assume that the, the signal uh, spectrum exists in just some small region of minus Fs over 2, to Fs over 2. Um, and so when we apply this, this digital filter here, um, what we're doing is we're filtering down to the same, uh, you know, to the smaller bandwidth where the, where the signal lives. Um, and since a large portion of the noise will be spread over uniformly over a range of frequencies outside where the signal is, this filter will keep all of the signal all right, maybe get rid of some of it um, just because we're talking about a, a non-ideal filter, but um, we can make that as close to ideal as we want. 
So we pretty much get all of the signal. Um, so the noise signal or the, the, the signal power is not reduced. Um, but the noise power is reduced because the noise outside of where the signal band is will get um, you know, almost completely uh, attenuated or significantly attenuated by the, by the filter. And so therefore the noise power is reduced, the signal power stays the same, and so our signal to noise ratio goes up. And if you remember, we talked about the signal to noise ratio being related to the effective number of bits. In fact, the effective number of bits essentially says that your um, A to D converter is working as if it has this number of bits uh, from an SNR point of view. Um, so we end up with some number of extra effective number of bits. It looks like we have these effective number of bits. We don't really physically have that number of bits, um, but we have an effective number of bits. And to kind of puzzle our way out of this, how can we have a physically smaller number of bits but a larger effective number of bits? Um, it would be akin to you know, saying that I have a, a um, I have some fractional value which I've I've measured with a bunch of noisy integers, um, which I then average together um, to kind of get rid of the effect of this uh, these noisy integers. So, um, in other words, you can think of it. You know, maybe I've got a number that's like five point seven. Uh, and I'm going to observe that with some noise added in, but then quantized, uh, you know, or rounded to the nearest integer. Um, if I average over enough of those, I can get a number that is closer to the true fractional value just from, from the integer. So it's, it's kind of like that. Um, so what we're seeing here is an increase in the effective number of bits, but at the expense of... Um, a reduced processing bandwidth. Um, or, to say it another way, um, instead of thinking of a reduced processing bandwidth, uh, well, let me back up. The reduced processing bandwidth for a given FS. <clears throat> to say that another way, we get an increased effective number of bits at the expense of having to sample much, much faster than we would otherwise. So here's a picture that uh, illustrates how this um, how this works. So um, the quantization noise power spectral density, uh, as we said, is uniformly spread over minus fs over two to fs over two. Um, so here is the the frequency axis, and I'm only showing the positive side of it. Everything would be symmetric on the other side as far as power spectrums go, and uh, so we, we see the, the, the signal's power spectrum um, sketched out here, just some arbitrary um, you know, structure there that um, could be whatever shape is, is appropriate for the signal. I just drew something. <clears throat> we see this height here is the height of the power spectral density of the quantization noise. So it's uniformly spread. Um, and since we know the power of the quantization noise is delta squared over 12, um, where delta is the quantization uh, interval size, we, we derived that result earlier, um, the, the area underneath this power spectral density, including the, the negative side as well, um, would be... Um, this delta squared over 12. So, um, so really we can think about the, the height of this would be delta squared over 12 divided by fs. Um, so that we take that number, multiply it by fs, which is the, the total width of both the positive and negative side of this, and we would find the, the area of this power spectral density. So the power uh, of the noise is, is the area underneath the power spectral density. <clears throat> now, uh, we just said that since our signal is concentrated in some very uh, small range of, of frequencies uh, down near zero, we can slap a digital filter on here and keep the signal 
but throw away the noise. Um, and so in, in, in this example, we see that we are um, cutting the band to one-eighth of, of what it was. It, it did go out to, uh, um, I'm sorry, one-quarter of what uh, it was before. It did go out to fs over 2, now it goes only out to fs over 8. Um, so the noise power after filtering would be just this area um, plus the area underneath on, on the negative frequency side. Uh, and since it's uh, one-fourth the area, um, we would have uh, delta squared divided by 4 times 12. And um, so what we see, this, the signal-to-noise ratio now will, um, will get cut by a factor of 4. Um, and so what that ends up corresponding to is 6 dB um, less noise. So um, for a quartering of the bandwidth, we get 6 dB more SNR. And if you remember, we had a, a relationship that said we, for every extra bit, we got 6 dB more SNR. So what we're seeing here is that we get one additional effective, uh, effective bits for every quartering of the bandwidth or... Um, since an octave is considered to be uh, a halving or a doubling of frequency, we get a half bit for every octave uh, of, of oversampling. And um, although this is, is a way to uh, trade bandwidth for bits, uh, and bandwidth here is the bandwidth of our A to D converter, so technically this really should be sampling rate, trading FS for bits, um, but <clears throat> the terminology in, in the literature is often to trade bandwidth for, for bits, just because I think it has a nicer alliteration. Uh, but this half bit uh, gain for, uh, for every octave of oversampling is a fairly inefficient trade. Um, so um, people then started looking for ways of improving this trade. Uh, and so the technology known as a sigma delta A to D converter is um, you know, kind of the premier way of, of doing this trade. Um, so the basic idea is just as we've been describing, uh, we're using a very high oversampling rate. And we use some inside this A to D converter, there's a, you know, basically a standard A to D converter, but we're generally using very low number of bits um, and sometimes just one one bit um, a to d inside and you know i'll comment here um, on on the one bit part let me erase that and do a better job underlining that uh, the the one bit part is is important because it's very easy to make a one bit a to d converter um, if you remember when we talked about um, you know, some of the more physical aspects of A to D converters, we talked about nonlinearities and we talked about missed bits um, and, and things like that um, that would lead to um, you know, uh, spurs and definition of spurious free dynamic range and things like that. Um, well, it's very easy to make um, a one-bit A to D converter, and you don't have to worry about linearity or anything like that because it's just it's one bit. Um, so um, so we can make those very um, accurately uh, without these uh, other uh, characteristics like nonlinearity, missed bit or missed codes, and things like that uh, coming into play. Uh, and then we use this um, idea of oversampling to convert that physical one bit A to D converter into a much higher bit um, effective A to D converter. And so the overall package becomes uh, a much better uh, device. But it is also possible to not do one bit uh, internal A to D converters um, to use some, you know, uh, you know, maybe four or five, six, seven, maybe even eight bit A to D converter in there. Um, still well designed though, um, and then wrap this A to D, the sigma delta A to D thing around it to get an even higher 
um, bit. So let's take a look at how this works. Um, so let me uh, get rid of some of this stuff here first before we head off to do that. Um, so here's the, here's the basic idea. Um, we use this low bit A to D converter and then we use DSP noise shaping um, to uh, get a noise that is in, instead of having it uniformly spread um, we try to push as much of its power outside um, outside the range of the uh, uh, the spectral range of the signal as we possibly can um, so uh, we need to make a distinction here between the discrete time signal which we can get from you know a, a, a sampling without a discrete without a quantization um, so um, I'm not going to go into the details of of how we actually implement that um, you can read about that in, in in other places the textbook may have some details on that I honestly can't remember um, but the basic idea is um, it, it's kind of like a you know half half disc, uh, digital half uh, um, analog, so it's it's digital from the discrete time point of view. So there are samples, um, but uh, it's analog from the point of view of uh, processing the values. Um, oh, and this this E symbol here should really be a summation symbol. So um, sorry about that. Um, let me see if I can uh, get rid of that just for the time being. Oh, apparently I can't erase it, so maybe I can get rid of it that way. Let's see. Okay, good. It's gone. All right, so our signal X of N comes in. Um, we've got a discrete time filter, but not a digital filter. Um, <clears throat> so the signal coming out of here is discrete in time, but not discrete in value. And then we have an A to D converter. We'll say that it has N bits. Um, N could be 1. And we're sampling at a rate of D times FS, where um, FS would be the appropriate sampling rate for, um, for the signal by itself. And so now we have uh, Y of N is um, uh, the, the signal discretized in time and discretized in value. Uh, of whatever one in. But remember, it's not just X. It's X with some feedback term that's coming back, and we'll see what that is <clears throat> in just a second. And uh, also gone through a filter. So so we've got this, this feedback structure going on here, and you know, I don't want to go into the details of, of uh, all the theory of, of feedback systems, um, but the basic idea is that um, we, we need to write, be able to write a transfer function for, from here um, to here um, to see what effect this H of Z has, including this feedback. And notice that the feedback takes this uh, time sampled and value sampled signal, Y of N, that has N bits per sample runs it through an n-bit DAC and creates a, a signal that gets fed back. Um, so we, our goal is to use this filter inside this feedback loop so that uh, the effect of passing X to Y uh, is, is there's hardly any impact on the signal itself. But the quantization noise introduced by the a to D converter um, gets attenuated in the signal band and um, the power then gets pushed outside of the um, of the signal band and then finally we do um, so you know all of this let me back up here let me get rid of some of this stuff here so all of this the job of it is to leave the signal untouched but put the uh, power spectral density of the noise um, have it so that the, the vast majority of the power of the noise lies outside of the signal band. Then we apply our filter, um, and since we are um, running at such a, a high rate, we can then also decimate. So 
Uh, we talked about decimation at the uh, you know, briefly, I think in the first or second set of notes. It's basically just throwing away uh, some number of samples. So in this case, out of every D samples that have gone through the filter, um, we would keep one and throw away D minus one of those. Now there are more efficient ways to actually implement that, but that's fundamentally what we do. So we end up at a rate FS, and we end up with some additional number of effective number of bits. <clears throat> And uh, so we could actually store those in, uh, you know, we end up with, with words that are, uh, you know, binary words that have more bits than what our A to D converter really has. Um, so when, when we implement this filter, um, we have to implement it in a higher precision uh, than, than the samples that are going in. So um, if we have eight bits going in, um, we'll have you know, some larger number of bits uh, per sample coming out. So let's briefly just take a look at how this works into uh, the vast majority of the details on this. Uh, just want to try to get to the point where you can just kind of understand the basics of, of sigma to deltas or sigma delta A to D converters um, and, uh, you know, just have an understanding that they exist, and then if you ever run into them, you can go dig into them deeper. Uh, again, the, the G's here got uh, translated improperly. They should be sigma, um, or summations inside here. Um, okay, so, um, so here we're just looking at uh, it, it, it modeling the A to D converter as an additive uh, white noise. Um, so this, this Q of Z would be the Z transform of that <coughs> noise. And uh, um, we have a, a, a classic feedback loop here. And we've got basically two inputs, X of Z and, and Q of Z. So we can find out um, how each of them contributes to uh, the output by basically just setting uh, one of them to zero and, and looking at the, uh, the transfer function. So if we set Q of Z to zero, then it looks like this is just straight through. Um, and then we have a, a, a feedback loop where we've got a H of Z is the feed forward um, path, and we've got a, a feedback loop that goes um, like this. And... Uh, it's um, pretty straightforward to um, derive that, but it is also a very standard uh, result for such a, a feedback uh, system that uh, the gain or the transfer function from x of z to y of z uh, with, with q of z set to zero is just the feed forward transfer function h of z and then 1 plus h of z down in the denominator. And um, so we can see that if we make h of z such that over some range of frequencies um, where we're trying to pass the, the, the signal, if we make h of z large over that range of frequencies, then uh, so large that 1 plus h of z becomes approximately equal to h of z, then this becomes equal to 1. Um, and so we, we get y of z is just equal to x of z over that range. And then, you know, obviously there will be some, some range out, uh, some frequency range outside of the, the band where we have our signal, uh, where we don't really care um, what happens and in that range. <coughs> this h of z over 1 plus h of z um, can be allowed to drop off and, uh, and our signal is, isn't passed in that range. Um, but that's, that's fine because the, the signal is not intended to, to live out there. Now the other thing that we want is um, to find out how q goes through to y. And so if we imagine setting this to 0, um, that's like 
connecting this back like this with a with a negative sign uh, uh, applied. And so again, you can apply standard uh, feedback theory from a control systems course um, and find the transfer function for that, in which case we have um, 1 over uh, 1 plus h of z. And uh, so I don't uh, claim that that is exactly always equal to the straight line, but if we can make it something like that straight line, um, we'll see that we can get a nice um, improvement. So, um, so the design of these A to D converters basically relies on understanding how um, this structure works and then picking the H of Z appropriately. So, um, you know, if you dig into these deeper, uh, there is discussion over, uh, you know, discussion into you know, how, what structure you use for H of Z and, and how do you get these different, uh, these different shapes. Um, but like I said, I'm really just trying to set the stage here for how these things work. Um, so um, take a look at this and uh, basically, uh, we think about the order of these, um, of this noise shaping. And uh, we've already seen the, the no noise shaping. Uh, so that would be um, this, this case here, uh, where we just run a regular A to D converter with no sigma delta. So that has none of this feedback loop. Um, and we get a, a flat, uniform power spectral density for our noise, and when we did that, we saw that our trade rate was um, a half a bit per octave of oversampling. Um, if we make a first order noise shaping, then um, if you remember that, that straight line that we saw uh, multiplying the, the Q of Z uh, on the previous slide, um, when we look at the power spectral density that that straight line is 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 a first order and when it becomes uh the power when it when you look at the effect of that on the power spectral density that becomes squared and you get this this quadratic effect um so first order noise shaping if we do the analysis of that you can see that um compared to what's inside the band for um the no noise uh, shaping, we can see that we get um, something considerably less. So the area underneath this um, red curve would be the the power of the noise after that sigma delta noise shaping effect, uh, and it can be shown that in that uh, in in that case, our trade now becomes one point five bits per octave. So we can think of this as a zero or th zeroth order, first order, second order. Second order would have something that uh, follows this, um, this shape. And uh, we can see that what we've done is pushed the noise even, f even more outside of our signal band um, and so now the area underneath this blue curve is the power um, after all of this sigma delta noise shaping and so forth. And so that would give us even more um, bits. In fact, it gives us 2.5 bits per octave. And, and you can see the pattern here, 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5. So third order would give you 3.5 and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, obviously it becomes harder to build all these things with these higher order um, noise shaping, um, but they are possible. It is possible to do these things and uh, um, get some really high performance A to D converters by, by doing that. <coughs> uh, and so if we then look at um, the SNR improvement as a function of the oversampling factor, um, so this is just looking at a plot of that, um, you know, number of bits per, um, per octave uh, with the number of bits converted into an SNR improvement. So remember, for every one bit, you get an SNR improvement of 6 dB 
Um, so that's six dB um, per bit per you know per octave essentially. Um, so um, by increasing the oversampling factor, we're we're uh, allowing to spread that uh, power spectral density further and further um, over the um, uh, you know o over the range minus fs over two up to fs over two, and with the oversampling factor, our fs over two gets pushed further and further out. So you can just see that with second order noise um, shaping. Um, we can get some pretty impressive signal-to-noise ratio improvements, um, but we have to sample very, very fast, you know, hundreds of times faster than what we would ordinarily sample. So um, that pushes us to the technological limit, um, but still, theoretically, these things are, are possible. And so now um, the theorists have thrown the gauntlet down and, and the... the the people who build chips step in to try to um, uh, step up to the uh, to the challenge and actually build things that that will work. So to just summarize this very brief introduction to sigma delta, uh, and again, I'm you know not my intention is not to provide you with all the details of exactly how this works, just to make you aware of the existence of these technologies and these approaches so that you're aware of them and if you ever need to go down this avenue you've you've got a, a good head start on that so um, there are three main parts of the advantage of the signal delta uh, sigma delta a, a to d converter so um, with, with oversampling we, we didn't really mention this but uh, with, with the oversampling remember our our aliasing uh, becomes less of an issue because we're going to be really doing our first sampling uh, at a very, very high sampling rate. And then remember there is that um, filtering effect in the discrete time world. So effectively we can make a, you know, a, a pretty simple um, analog anti-aliasing filter out front that only needs to keep things out above this very high sampling rate. <clears throat> um, and then effectively we're doing um, you know, kind of a discrete time, uh, digital, uh, well, not digital, uh, discrete time uh, design of a effective anti-aliasing filter inside um, the, the 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 sigma delta loop, uh, and of course the the second advantage is that uh, that filter H of Z inside the loop um, allows us to achieve noise shaping, which effectively pushes um, down the, the noise inside the signal band and pushes it outside um, the, the, the signal band. And uh, so by doing that, we can get a, an increase in the effective number of bits, which means that to achieve whatever uh, true effective number of bits we want, we can start with a physical A to D converter inside that has a lower number of bits than what we ultimately end up with, and it's easier to make these things close, um, closer to ideal than it is for these true, really high bit A to D converters. Um, so the the main disadvantage is because we're using the the high sampling rate to um, effectively get more number of bits. Um, we ultimately um, filter down and decimate back down to a, a lower sampling rate. Um, it's hard to um, get really wide band sigma delta converters. So uh, these things have been very popular for audio, um, but not necessarily um, widely used in um, things like radars and communication signals and things like that. But um, you know, to be honest, I haven't looked at the progress being made in these in, in quite a while because um, it's, it's not something that, that my research focuses on. Um, so, you know, 15 years ago, progress was being made on extending these to higher and higher sampling rates. Um, but I don't know whether there's been enough of a desire to push those, uh, um, even higher, but, uh, but it may be, I don't know. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I just haven't kept up with it. 
All right, so we'll stop there, and uh, this concludes our study of uh, sampling. Uh, some things we went into a fair amount of detail on, and some things we didn't. Um, but hopefully this provides you with a nice introduction to some of the more esoteric aspects of, of sampling. All right, see you in the next note set.